right. Well, thanks, John, for uh, inviting us. And this is uh, going to be very uh, interesting. I'm, I'm excited to get some uh, thoughts on uh, this research. The area that we're going to be talking about is one that's becoming more important, I would say, as more and more people uh, enter retirement with uh, a pool of assets to invest. And the question is, how should they uh, invest and spend down those assets to create a retirement? Uh, this is joint work with a colleague at Financial Engines, John Watson. Uh, and of course, as a uh, corporate presenter, I always have to have the, this is views of the authors and not necessarily the views of the, uh, of the company. So anyway, this is research uh, about that, what should you do with that pool of assets? And I thought I would start with <coughs> Highlighting two words, leverage, retirement. I think the natural reaction is, are you crazy? What are you talking about? <laughs> and so this discussion, I hope I can convince you at least that um, there is a rational reason why these might go together. And, uh, <clears throat> but we'll see. The beginning of the story is uh, a, trying to discover what is the right set of preferences to assume for a retiree. And I think this is probably the best way to approach most of these uh, consumer decision uh, problems. Uh, for us, when we went to look at uh, what people were currently doing, we were actually fairly surprised. If you go to the financial planning literature, read it, it is full and almost uniformly full of uh, papers and analyses and strategies that take as either a given or a desired outcome something called a sustainable withdrawal rate. The objective of the <coughs> ubiquitous 4% rule, the, by far and away the most popular retirement rule out there, was explicitly to find a strategy <coughs> that created sustainable spending in retirement. And there's a whole host of others. But what we found surprising was this idea of sustainable spending seems to be very ingrained in the group that's focused on talking to individuals and kind of trying to figure out a way to create strategies that they find desirable, uh, yet don't really find that, that preference doesn't really find its way into the economic literature that much. And, and most of what we wanted to do here was to see what we would get if we took this notion and, and added it to some of the more standard uh, utility maximization frameworks. Uh, there are some other areas, though, where this kind of a flavor of this you get. You certainly, if you go into private wealth management, they have a goal-based and the main goal that you'll see there is sustaining standard of living. So there's a, an element of that. Uh, it happens to be very related to loss aversion, so behavioral economics. And, and in psychology, there's a, a notion of a, a desirability of non-decreasing sequences. So when you're setting up your decisions or your affairs, you, you, people tend to want to do it so that the future is at least as good as the present and perhaps better. And so. I do think there's some other areas. Um, when we actually first looked at the financial planning literature, our first paper was, these strategies are not very good. Let's put it that way. I <laughs> uh, actually wrote a paper with uh, John and, and Bill Sharp. And, and the point of that was that they don't seem to be uh, rationally ap applying uh, a, a strategy. Doesn't seem to be matched up with what they, they wanted to do. Uh, or with any sort of notion of utility maximization. This paper, though, is saying, well, what if they're right? What if there is a sustainable uh, spending preference? Is there an optimal strategy with that preference? And if so, what, what does it look like? Uh, <clears throat> so what we found was uh, if you take the standard Merton Samuelson uh, investment under uncertainty expected utility model, add a sustainable consumption preference. That is, instead of picking any strategy, you're limited to strategies that have spending rates or consumption rates that are non-decreasing. You can actually solve that uh, optimization problem. 
The difficulty you'll find is that the solution involves a very complex strategy that requires continuous trading and lots of it, which is not particularly practical for retirees. Um, but with a little work, you'll also find that there's something that's approximately uh, the same strategy, approximately in terms of, of the utility context. And that is what I'll describe to you as the floor leverage rule. So here's what the floor leverage rule is. Um, <clears throat> the first part of it is, uh, I think, something that's not very controversial, which is take a large fraction of your wealth and use it to buy uh, income in retirement. And that could be, uh, depending on your preferences, uh, mostly what do you think of as what you're trying to sustain, you could, that could be a real floor, uh, and you would likely use some sort of uh, tips or tips, strips or that kind of thing. It could be a nominal floor where you're using uh, treasury zeros. Uh, depending on your preferences for annuities and the like, you could use annuities as part of the creation of this floor. Uh, that would actually lower the cost of creating the floor, which uh, makes your 85% buy more in terms of spending. But the vast majority of your money is invested in uh, an asset or an investment that's creating an income floor. The second part of it is take the surplus 15%, and invest it in a 3x leveraged daily rebalance equity. And I think this is the more controversial part of the strategy. Uh, there are a, a, a number of investment options that provide this. Uh, you can do it via mutual funds or ETFs. The only two uh, equity investments that I saw at least were reasonably priced ways of doing this were for the S&P, uh, or you could do it for the EVA index as well wanted to, and you couldn't really combine those because you can't do the, the reweighting without transactions. And part of what we wanted to do here was to have more of a buy and hold strategy. The final part of the rule, which makes it kind of complete and tells you what to do uh, through time, is annually you review this portfolio. And if your uh, surplus, which is this uh, equity investment, happens to be more than 15% of the value of your total portfolio, you take any amount, uh, any excess, and buy more income. And so the way it sort of works is as you go through time, if you have good equity returns, your income ratchets up. If you don't, your income stays flat uh, based on the, you know, the income floor. That's the, the rule. What I wanted to spend a bit of time on is, um, well, so, sorry, the, uh, the efficiency was fairly surprising. So this is kind of uh, in terms of how does it compare to optimal, there is a very, some various scenarios and cases that we look at, but by and large, it's somewhere between 98 and 99% of the utility you would get from the optimal strategy, you get from, not percent of utility, it's a sufficiency index where um, the, the way to think of it is if you had, a, say, a $100,000 invested in this strategy creating, you know, uh, consumption outcomes, you could get the same level of utility with the optimal strategy with only 98,000 or 99,000. And so uh, in that sense, uh, there's not a lot to be gained from moving from this to, to optimal. The intuition for why you get this strategy when you add this sustainability preference, um, I think the best way to start thinking about the intuition is to think about what is your uh, investment reaction to a loss experienced in the stock market. And there are really just three things you can do if you lose money in the stock market. One is you can buy more stock. And this is actually what you do if you're trying to maintain a constant risk portfolio. So if you were 50-50 stocks and your stocks decline, you sell bonds, you buy stocks. Constant risk. The other thing you can do is you can do nothing buy and hold. Um, <clears throat> the final thing you can do is you can sell stock. So the stocks go down and you uh, decide that you want to sell stocks and buy bonds. An example of that type of strategy is um, constant proportion portfolio insurance, something people may or may not be familiar with. Uh, 
Um, but the, the way to think about this person in this uh, utility setting is what happens when their wealth declines is they actually get closer to their being able to, being able to not support their floor. So the floor becomes more at risk the, the less wealth you have. And so they become more conservative or they, they want to change their investments in order to uh, eliminate or lower the possibility that they um, have to go back on their sustainable spending. And so this is the type of strategy, if, you, if stocks decline, I want to actually get more conservative. And the reason here is that concern for sustaining spending <coughs> leads to a lower risk preference as your wealth declines. And that's kind of the intuition. It actually works in reverse. If you've had this happen and you've kind of gotten worried about the stock market and gotten out, if the stock market goes back up, you do the reverse. You kind of are now further away from your sustainable spending floor and you're now willing to um, invest more or you have a, a higher tolerance for risk. Uh, once you get to a certain distance away from your floor and it becomes uh, clear that you are able to maintain it, then additional gains actually, that's where you get the surplus and then you start, that, this person often kind of rant, ratchets up their consumption and, and the whole game starts again. <clears throat> Let me talk to you a few minutes about constant proportion portfolio insurance. I want to illustrate that and point out the challenges with actually doing this type of strategy. Um, some of the challenges are, are well known. One of the uh, things I want to convince you of, I think, is that it's, it's changed in the past few years. This time is different. Um, <laughs> so here we go. We have a person, in, and I'm starting them off with a 55-45. So they have 100 bucks. They have $55 in bonds, $45 in stocks. I'm choosing $45 because it's a multiple of three, and it actually relates to the full leverage rule better. So, uh, but it is a little bit of an odd case. Now, what happens if stocks decline by five bucks? So in this constant proportion portfolio insurance strategy, uh, you want to become more conservative. You've, you've lost wealth. And you sell $10 in stocks and you buy $10 in bonds. And your ending strategy is 65-30. And it's called 3x because you can see the impact on your stock portfolio went from 45 to 30. That's three times the magnitude of the, the loss in the stock portfolio, which was only $5. So the change in your stock portfolio is 15. The loss in the stock portfolio is 5. So that's, that's the uh, sort of starting and ending portfolio in a reaction to a, five, a loss of $5, which is about 10 or 11% of the portfolio, of the um, stock portfolio. Now, if the stock market were to continue to decline, and now you're starting with the 65-30 portfolio, but you lose another $5, so what's that, a sixth, 17% drop in the stock market. Again, you would sell $10 in stocks, buy $10 in bonds, and your resulting portfolio for now you have $80, or $90, it's 75.15. So you're kind of ratcheting down the risk. You can do it another time. If the market drops a third, uh, you would actually be out of the market. And you would end with 85.0. And so the, the 85 here is kind of the floor in this example. That's how much, if you were able to execute these trades, that's how much you would kind of have in the calamitous scenario. Two major problems with these CPPI strategies. Um, one is that frequent trading. So the, the really to do this, you're, you're supposed to do it sort of minute by minute so that you're able to get in and get trades in before the markets move too much uh, and create problems. This is actually even worse when you think that the bond portfolio here is a income creating portfolio because buying and selling, say an annuity or even a, a ladder of strips is a very expensive uh, proposition and may not even be possible. So kind of the idea of, of moving back and forth between equities and fixed income is is uh, virtually impossible uh, when income is one of the portfolios that you have. The other thing is, is that you may not be able to make these trades in time. So even if your idea is, well, I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna sell stock before I blow through my $85 floor, um, markets could 
uh, prices could gap before you can trade. Uh, or you may not be able, you know, these, uh, if you're not sort of tied into the, the market and you can't, you know, get a trade in and somebody can get it in in nanoseconds and you're only in microseconds or, you know, whatever, uh, you won't be able to get these trades in. And so, two fundamental problems. I think the, the thing to think about is how can you overcome those problems? And I highlight here the four portfolios that correspond to different uh, CPPI portfolios. The first one is what did you, what did you want when you had $100, $55.45? What did you want when you, wanted, when you had $95, $90, and $85? Those were the four kind of portfolios you were trying to get. And what I think is interesting is what I call practical CPPI. What happens when you have access to a 3x levered fund? So let me look at this strategy. I start with 100 bucks, and I'm going to buy uh, $85 worth of bonds. I'm going to put $15 in a 3x levered fund. And what a 3x levered fund does is for every dollar you give the 3x levered fund, they borrow $2, add it to your dollar, and invest the $3 in the, uh, in the stock market. If I were to put $15 in this fund, that fund is contributing to my overall exposure, minus $30 worth of bonds, and plus $45 worth of stocks. Now, if I add that to my bond exposure, my overall exposure is $55 bonds, $45 stocks. So, here's a hint. <laughs> First one, check, $100, I get what I want. What's interesting is if the levered fund if the markets drop and the lever fund loses $5, and now I have $95, and I go through the same exercise, you'll see I still have $85 in the bond fund, $10 in the levered fund, and I work through what that means. My overall portfolio is $65.30, which is what I wanted. Uh, I lose another $5, uh, I have $75.15, which is what I wanted. If markets are calamitous and somehow or another they gap down or what have you, and I lose all the investment in the levered fund, it's a limited liability fund, uh, I still have my bond portfolio. Uh, so I do have this sort of floor of $85, and importantly, I've gotten all the, all the allocations I was interested in. I did it with a buy and hold strategy. And I really need, I think, a buy and hold strategy, especially on the fixed income side or on the income producing side. So I could use that $85 to actually buy an annuity or buy a ladder of, of uh, income producing instruments or something like that. And I don't have to worry about going in and out of that in order to implement this strategy. Uh, moreover, I have uh, limited liability because I'm using a third party to do the, um, to do the chain. This graph is an illustration of what happens if you were to have uh, received the returns that the S&P 500 generated over different time periods. And so what would, the, um, what would the spending pattern have been if you were to have been, say, lucky enough to retire in 1950 and experience those sets of returns? Um, and, and I wanted to illustrate two things with this. One is that the spread is pretty wide. Uh, even though only 15% of your portfolio is invested in at risk in the stock market, the outcomes can be pretty large, uh, large and differential. So the way to read this is the, the 1950 person, you're starting at about a um, little over four. So if you had a, a, a million dollars, this would be $40,000 in income, rough 42,000 or so to start. Uh, by, the, by the time they're 85, their uh, annual income is over 120,000. The other characteristics that seems to be typical is th these uh, 3x returns are pretty volatile. Uh, if you have a downturn, your consumption doesn't go down, but you have to wait potentially a long time for it to go up at all. And so you'll see that, so in the, uh, in the, uh, the 1960 person sort of ratchets up a little bit, uh, and then in the early 1970s, there was a drop in the, in the stock market, and it's flat from, from there forward. 
Uh, best time to retire, based on this metric, would have been uh, 1980. They ended up at uh, over 15% of the initial wealth being the annual income. And then the person in 2000 actually was flat. They had a drop at the beginning of the period, through the, uh, the, the, the bubble bursting, uh, and then right when they were about to kind of break into the money again, uh, the financial crisis occurred. And they hadn't recovered, this goes through 2012, they were, their, their surplus uh, was, I think it was uh, 60 or 70 percent of the, the max by the time 2012 rolled around. So perhaps they would get a raise in 2013, it'd be a near thing based on current returns. But that's what it looks like. Uh, so the, the, still a big spread, a surprising spread to me, given the fairly small percentage of your portfolio that's, that's allocated to equities. But this property of uh, the impact of a loss in the stock market is not a drop in consumption, kind of by design, but it could be a fairly long period of time at level consumption. If you look at the ending kind of where you are at age 85, I did that by year, and um, all right, almost done. Uh, this is what it looks like if you, and then, uh, so the 1950, 1960, 70, 80, 90 are, are, are replicated from the earth, earlier slide. This is kind of what does it look like at the end of this 20 year period, even though you have uh, years to go. Um, and you'll see that the returns, there's a lot of overlapping periods, so they're, they're um, correlated with the performance of the years around them, but you can see a pretty wide spread between, say, 6% and 15%. Um, <clears throat> so that it, it really is, you are, um, you both have a pretty substantial floor, but you are exposed to the markets, and depending on what the markets do, you will have uh, substantially higher or, uh, um, or lower spending. Let me conclude with, so what, what role did leverage play? So the start of the story is, we ha we, it seems like there's a group that have a preference for sustainable spending. That comes into the story by saying, well, when their wealth declines, they start having a concern that they won't be able to maintain their lifestyle. That creates a lower risk tolerance. Leverage here is not used to try to increase your equity exposure beyond 100% or try to, try to get riskier than you could otherwise get sort of with normal investments. Leverage is used to quickly lower your risk profile when markets decline, facilitate this buy and hold strategy, uh, and allow the purchase of a floor guarantee that may not be, um, you may not be able to get in and out of. In this sense, I think leverage helps manage risk and is not really being used to take excessive risk. And because it's a, a room full of economists, uh, I wanted to, to end with some speculation. Uh, if this is reflective of a reasonable, uh, preferences for a reasonable number of people out there, then um, this, this research really, I mean, people don't have to sort of formally adopt this strategy. If they feel this way when they experience uh, wealth declines due to stock markets, they would still have this sort of behavior like, I need to get out of the market and have um, this kind of, of uh, response. And the issue could be in asset prices. If everybody, there's a, a downward shock, everybody decides they're concerned about sustaining their standard of living, and they all want to become more conservative at once, all of a sudden, society's sort of average risk tolerance has dropped a lot, and asset prices could fall dramatically. Similarly, as they go up, average risk tolerances can go up pretty fast, and so you, can, you could imagine in a, in a more uh, equilibrium type world, this type of model would suggest asset prices that swing wildly, not because of any inefficiency per se, but just because the average risk tolerance in the marketplace swings wildly between these, uh, these kind of extremes. With that, I'm going to
for the discussant is uh, Clement Seal. Thank you very much to CEPR and the uh, Stanford Center for Longevity to invite me to discuss this paper. I very much enjoyed this paper. And I think the paper really makes a very important proposal that has many advantages to conventional ways to arrange this floor like uh, portfolio insurance. Uh, the paper proposes an investment strategy for retirees that insist on sustainable spending but are willing to tolerate investment risk. And it's a very simple strategy. On one hand, you put 85% of your portfolio into risk-free assets or annuities. You might match it according to your future consumption needs. And then a small portion of the portfolio, 15%, goes, for example, into triple levered equity securities. And an important part here is that those have limited liability, as was mentioned before. And that means that although you are highly levered and you might have some exposure, you will never lose more than those 15%. And that guarantees that 85% of your portfolio uh, remains intact. And that's a big advantage of getting those separate exchange traded funds, for example, to implement it instead of trying to do it dynamically. Because if markets move fast and they crash, for example, you wouldn't have an opportunity to trade dynamically. And we saw that during the crash of 87, that portfolio insurance didn't work out too well. And in some sense, the strategy achieved simultaneously two goals that might at first glance appear to be contradictory. On one hand, you guarantee a minimum real spending level at retirement. But then as well, you get quite a bit of exposure to equity securities. And at first glance, that might appear contradictory, but this is a strategy that can help you to achieve both of those goals. Now, my discussion will uh, review the results. It will look at the distribution yeah. of spending levels, and it will as well compare it with a more conventional Merton Samuelson <coughs> type approach to see what are the advantages or what are the costs of getting this guarantee. Just to describe the initial asset composition, you start out with 15% of a triple levered ETF and 85% in bonds. And now if you decompose the triple levered ETF, as was mentioned before, that ETF goes out and borrows money and therefore effectively it has a short position in bonds equal to 30% and then it invests those borrowed funds as well in stocks and that's how it gets a 45% exposure to bonds, uh, to stocks. And overall if you look at the bond exposure, that is actually reduced because on one hand the investor owns 85% in those bonds, but then the ETF itself borrows money and that's equal to a short position of bonds of 30% and if you net out this long position of the investor and the short position of the ETF, you end up with a net bond position of 55%. And therefore initially or instantaneously you have those exposures, effectively your portfolio has 45% stocks, but eventually the losses are limited to 15% since you structured it as a ETF. Now if the stock prices go up 20%, for example, then your value of your ETF will increase quite significantly. It will increase by 60%. And then you will sell some of those ETF holdings, put them into bonds, and that ratchets up your consumption permanently. Uh, but the weights look exactly the same. On the other hand, if you have a 20% drop in the stock price, then your value of the ETF will decrease. In, your, in this example, it will drop to 6% of your portfolio value, and 94% will now be invested in bonds, and therefore your portfolio will now be much safer, and effectively you are only 18% invested in stocks. Now, to get a better idea of how the spending looks in retirement, I ran a thousand Monte Carlo simulation. It's very similar to what they did in the paper, although they did, I think, a hundred thousand simulations. And 
I did it for their real floor leverage rule, but then I did it as well for the simple conventional Samuelson-Merton optimization with constant risk uh, or constant relative risk aversion, just to be able to, to quantify what are the costs and the benefits of having this floor rule. Now this is just one of those 1,000 simulations. It shows the spending rate. And before we saw a very similar chart, initially it starts at about 3%. That means if your portfolio is worth a million dollars, you will have $30,000 to spend the first year. And then if the stock market does well, you can increase your, uh, your spending then in this, for the first 10 years here, you don't really have a strong stock market if it's flat, but then towards the end, it increases significantly. Now, just again to explain, the horizontal axis shows here years after retirement. They use a 40-year horizon, which is very long. If you retire at 65, you would uh, plan out up to 105, and 20 years would be when uh, retirees, for example, 85 years old. That's 20 years after retirement. And we see with that rule, uh, spending will strictly increase. And the example I have here is with real spending, and therefore your real spending power will increase. Now, if we look at the whole distribution of those 1,000 different simulations, we get the following uh, chart. Again, the horizontal axis shows here the years after retirement. The vertical axis shows the real spending using their rule. And the first percentile here, that's the worst 1% of outcomes. And in those cases, the stock market does very poorly. And you get the same spending level throughout your retirement. But it will never go down because you have these guarantees. If you look at the 10 percentile, you have a slight increase of spending over time. And the median is shown here. And that has actually a pretty significant increase in spending. It starts out, again, with 3%. But then, for example, 20 years after retirement, it will be about 5 or so uh, percent. But clearly, you see that there's a lot of dispersion, as well as was mentioned before, in your spending level in the future. Now, if we look at the samuelson Burton. Uh, rule with constant relative risk aversion and look at the, again at those percentiles how they work out there are three differences first of all initially when you retire you can actually uh, spend more you can consume more and instead of three percent it increases to about five percent second a second difference is that with the samuelson merton constant relative risk aversion, you are, of course, willing to reduce your consumption if the stock market does poorly. And the first percentile you see can be actually quite low. For example, after 30 years, when you're 95, it is about 2%. And therefore, your spending, your real spending power would have declined quite uh, significantly. And here, the dotted line that just shows the minimum payment of the floor from their paper. And that is pretty similar in the long term to the 10 percentile. Now, if we put them side by side, we see again the three differences. Uh, Samuelson Merton have more consumption early in retirement. They have the risk that your consumption, your real spending, might decline quite significantly if the stock market does poorly. And a third, maybe an unintended consequence of the triple lever is that you have much more upside potential, especially later in retirement, because of this leverage of the triple uh, generated by the ETF. And therefore, of course, it depends on what preferences you have. If people really don't like to reduce their consumption, this, the floor leverage rule, is, of course, the optimal uh, portfolio allocation. First, uh, let me talk a little bit about the utility function. Of course, the utility function that was used has a negative infinite utility if your consumption level would go down. 
But of course, even if you allow some possibility that consumption can go down, uh, you might get similar results as long as people are sufficiently averse to declines <coughs> in uh, consumption. Now, two general comments on the utility function, and that goes back to some of the discussion we had yesterday. It's the question of when is the marginal utility of consumption higher. On one hand, you could think maybe when you are still in your 60s or early 70s, you might enjoy more to travel around. You might have more utility from your money, from your consumption, and therefore backloaded consumption, like based on this rule, the floor rule, might uh, prevent you to benefit from this consumption. On the other hand, there might be healthcare expenses that might come later in life, and you might want to uh, provide for those. An alternative, of course, would get, be to have a long-term care insurance. A second aspect that is not discussed in the paper, and that, of course, affects as well whether you want to annuitize or not, is the quest motives. And, of course, having a backloaded spending might make a lot of sense if you have significant bequest motives. The next uh, point of my discussion is to, discuss, uh, to talk about the costs of levered securities. Now, uh, two possible ETFs that you could purchase would be uh, spy, Spiders and this U-Pro. The Spider is just a simple unlevered S&P 500 ETF, and it has an expense ratio of nine basis points, while the triple lever has an expense ratio of 95 uh, basis points. And as well, the turnover is very significantly different between the two. The turnover of the SPY is only when they change, pretty much only when they change the composition of the index. However, the triple lever has quite significantly more turnover because they need to rebalance portfolios to maintain those fixed. Uh, leverage levels. And potentially the duplication of cost due to this offsetting long and short bond positions could actually add a double layer of costs to your portfolio. And especially for long-term investors, that could be a disadvantage. And another aspect that I learned a lot from John is that you should take into account taxes, especially if that will be, of course, if it will be in a taxable account that potentially the taxes could be higher. Currently, UPRO did not make any taxable distributions. ETFs can often use in-kind uh, redemptions to reduce taxes. However, I'm not so certain that those are as easy for uh, those triple levered uh, ETFs as they are for long bonding strategies. Another aspect is potential counterparty risks. If you look at the holdings of uh, triple levered ETFs. I got that yesterday from their website. And most of their exposure, they actually gain through swap contracts, through over-the-counter swap contracts. And you see the counterparties are Deutsche Bank, Société Générale, UBS, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs. And then they have as well here the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 but those account for actually a small fraction of the exposure. Most of the exposure that they have is through those swap contracts, and there might potentially be counterparty risks. If Lehman Brothers, at that time it didn't exist yet, but if they had been a counterparty, it could have been problematic. However, you have as well to take into account that those counterparties would be troubled when uh, the stock market goes up. And usually those are not time periods where investment banks would go out of business. And therefore that might mitigate the problem for this long levered ETF. Might be more severe for the short levered ETFs. But counterparty risk could potentially be an issue here, especially for long term investors. Two final points. Uh, one is that although the investors themselves do not need to rebalance very frequently. The ETFs themselves, they actually need to rebalance quite frequently to maintain this triple leverage. And at the end of the day, they actually need to rebalance their positions. And for example, a 1% increase in the stock price of the S&P 500 uh, 
implies an around 2% increase in their stock positions. And therefore, the changes, the necessary rebalancings are quite important. Right now, those instruments are relatively small, but it is questionable when they become very popular, whether that could potentially lead to systemic issues that could destabilize markets, maybe not unlike the portfolio insurance of 87, especially if a lot of money is invested in those instruments, because what the rebalancing requires is after an up day, you need to go out and buy additional shares, and after a down day, you need to go out and sell additional shares. Finally, the last point is to look at the equity exposure, and that was mentioned in the presentation before, the equity exposure changes quite a bit over time. And here I took again just one random simulation, you see it start out at 45% exposure to equity securities. But then if the stock market drops, if the S&P 500 drops, then the exposure would be reduced. And we see quite a bit of volatility here. And at the end, this is one case where the value drops more than 33% and it goes to zero and zero is an absorbing state in this example. But more generally, we see pretty significant changes in the weights invested in stock securities. And again, if we go back to the more general question, if this becomes a very widely accepted and very widely followed strategy, there might be some general equilibrium considerations that people would move in and out significantly into stock securities. That could affect prices. And it as well goes back to the question of who should bear the risks. Should the older people that follow those strategies reduce their risk levels when markets performed poorly in the past? And should then the young people take on more risks? And that's more a systemic or general equilibrium uh, question. To summarize, the strategy guarantees certain spending level while still gaining exposure to the market. There's a lot of demand right now for those type of strategies. Uh, the strategy is optimal for households who have a large disutility of reduced spending. And for those households, it's a very important uh, strategy. But the strategy is potentially costly because ETFs might have higher and better trading costs and expenses. And potentially, it might as well lead to systemic problems if this strategy becomes very widely used and very widely used. Thank you. Uh, I can give a couple of uh, quick thoughts because I thank you. There's lots of great, uh, great comments in there. Um, some things that, that came to mind as you were uh, going through the discussion. Uh, one thing when you when you're looking at the uh, distribution of outcomes, uh, the uh, sort of the utility costs even in the even in the Merton Samuelson world of the bad states of nature, and it also the the expense of insuring against or, or purchasing income or spending in those states of nature is much I mean orders of magnitude more expensive than the than the um, the good states of the world. And so I, I think it's important when you're, when you're showing a distribution to ha kind of have the prices of those states. And so it, even though you're maybe only buying you know, up to the 10th or 20th or whatever percentile, the, those, are, those are pretty valuable states to have uh, income in, and um, both from a utility and a, and a difficulty of buying. Uh, the expenses, it's definitely more expensive to use these 3x leverage. It, it's, if that's the strategy you want, it's, it's way less expensive to use a third party to do it than to do it yourself. But compared to a, uh, a, a, like a buy and hold of a 55-45, it's, it's, uh, it's not nearly that cheap. Although I would, uh, you would want to account for the fact that you're getting 3x the exposure for 95 basis points. So maybe the right thing is three times the expense ratio of the, of the 1x expense. Um, uh, oh, the final thing about the market destabilization. Uh, my, my quick thought on that is, if these are preferences, these are preferences. 
these are going to drive the, the general behavior of people in the marketplace, whether or not they adopt this uh, strategy you know, formally with a third party or, or with an advisor or anything like that. If people view market events that cost, that lower their portfolio value as a, a call to become more conservative because they just can't handle the fact that their, their lifestyle's at risk, that happens irrespective of whether or not you know, people go through the formality of adopting the strategy. That kind of is their strategy. They just kind of formalized it. Um, so I think we have to figure out whether that's the case and then how to deal with it. Um, maybe, maybe it's kind of a don't shoot the messenger. You know, if this is preferences, this is preferences. But I, that, I'll stop there. And there's, uh, hopefully there's some questions. Okay, questions. Uh, Mike Hurd. People are uh, strongly momentum on, on average, maybe about 25% uh, are mean reversion types, but the other 75% are momentum types. And so that's another reason that you get destabilization. Uh, secondly, the, when I look at your floor leverage rules, I see these really high consumption levels at advanced old age, and I wonder what these people are going to be buying. If you look in the CEX, you look at budget shares at old age, is pretty clear that people's pr preferences for spending change. A lot of the things they're spending at, a, on age, a, at age 65, they're not spending on at age 85, and a whole range of things. Private transportation, for example, 6% rather than 20%. That frees up plenty of money for healthcare spending. They're pretty well insured. Uh, they're going to have trouble spending this 300% uh, <coughs> increase. And so, I mean, why, why as a I may think when I'm age 65, I'm going to be wanting to do that at age 85, but you know better. Uh, you should be telling these people, uh, you don't want that much consumption. You want more consumption today. You want the Merton Samuelson uh, consumption stream rather than this. So just a quick, quick response to that. I think there's different uh, floors that you can uh, uh, optimize against. One is a real floor, which uh, Clemens showed the comparison. Another one is a nominal floor, which has a 2.5% declining consumption. As that's, that's the inflation rates, suppose. Uh, and so that would be kind of the, the, the bottom outcome would be a declining of 2.5%. And in the model, you can, you can uh, decide that people's frame of reference for their preferences is a, uh, I think the nominal one uh, makes more sense from behavioral, but in principle, you could have any sort of if you, if you believe that real spending declines at 4% or, or has some other pattern, you could have that as the, the, the pattern of spending that then is ratcheted uh, over time. Uh, but I do think that the, perhaps the fallacy is that you know, people that hit retirement all of a sudden don't have any, they're, they're become infinitely risk averse and they don't have any preference for market investments and, and taking advantage of a, uh, a, a market risk premium. And so the question is how do you kind of reconcile a, a demand for some sort of floor uh, and an uh, and, uh, interest in risk? Uh, uh, Steve Vernon and then uh, Bob Willis. Okay, just a couple of questions. Um, or, or one would be have you compared the spending patterns with your uh, scenario. Well, first of all, thanks for doing that. This is, a, I always like to see more ways of generating income. So thank you for that, it's a good idea. Um, have you compared that to annuitization? And we know people don't like annuities, but that still is a standard to compare against. If you buy an inflation indexed annuity, you're done with your consumption risk, you're done with your longevity risk, assuming the insurance company's still there. And those have payout rates of anywhere to three and a half and 4% which I think if Clemens, you were showing 3% payout rate, you're starting at a higher initial payout rate and you're guaranteed to have that kind of assumption, consumption. Likewise, on a nominal annuity, you can, you're getting payout rates of 5.5%, 6%, so you're starting off a lot higher. And if your consumption isn't 
drops off um, in real terms and nominal terms it might be level. So I think comparing you know, the spending patterns under your solutions to annuities are good benchmarks. Um, and then if you go to the guaranteed minimum withdrawal benefits, you're again, you're getting higher payout rates and those are, have proven to be very popular and they're overcoming all the objections that traditional annuities have. So just a suggestion, I'd like to see the payout rates that you're projecting kind of juxtaposed to the payout rates in annuities just to see which ones might be better. Um, and so that's just a comment or a question. The second one is, could you package what you're suggesting in a 401k plan? Because I think what you're suggesting is not a do it, at, do it at home kind of thing. I think you're still gonna need an advisor, somebody either a 401k plan or advisor putting it together. So uh, could this be done within a 401k plan is my question. Okay. Okay, uh, Bob. Bob's question is completely incentive compatible because he's the next. <laughs> Do I have time to turn on the mic? <laughs> uh, uh, I was just thinking uh, in response to sort of Mike's concern with the uh, with these high high levels of income at, at very advanced ages, it might be interesting to sort of have like a Kotlikoff spivak type intergenerational sharing of risk model because the if I happen to be fortunate and have lots of money at age 90 then turning it over to my kids would be probably what would happen and uh, and, uh, and and that might uh, make it seem to me less wasteful to have that kind of money at, a, at this very advanced stage. Quick response to Steve. I think if you find someone that's willing to annuitize the difference is you're taking you're spending 15 percent less of your wealth on an annuity so kind of the, the, the comparison out of the gate would be this would start out 15 percent lower because you're buying an annuity with 85 percent instead of 100 percent and then you you know kind of the, the the scaling from that point forward is is pretty similar um, i don't think there's any way this could be packaged in a 401k plan because uh levered assets are just i mean you could do it in an ira but Okay, uh, Blake. Yeah. Thank you, Certainly a, a very interesting strategy. I thank you for writing it up. And I'm, I'm curious, I know as you point out, one of the challenges is just the limitation on implementation vehicles that provide leverage. If you played around with it using a 2x uh, levered ETFs, of course, there are more of those and potentially become proportionally more efficient. Right. Uh, we did. We looked at the, uh, well, in, in, in a limited sense, we looked at the, in the paper, we report the efficiency loss of a person that adopts the floor leverage rule with 3x leverage, and then, like I said, is a 1 or 2%. Uh, 2x leverage, uh, you know, using the surplus with 2x leverage as opposed to 3. Uh, I forget the numbers of maybe 4 or 5%. And then 1x leverage and then 0 leverage. Like, suppose they really did, they have these preferences, but they, they use all of their money for uh, a fixed income or, or, or zero risk. And that was an uh, inefficiency that could be upward of 20%. So there's, a, there's an efficiency assessment, but that's about it in, in, the, in the research that, so far. That's dependent on your risk aversion estimate. That's right. I mean, it, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, this is, had, a, this is if a... If you had a lower risk aversion, <clears throat> then that would give you a 2x and it would be efficient, wouldn't it? Uh, it, it could be. The, 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 the starting point that we used was a a market average uh, risk, I understand. risk tolerance. If you go, if you lower the risk tolerance, there's two competing factors. One is you want to spend more, so you kind of want the floor to be as high as possible. Um, and it's, it's not really clear whether you would use a 2x and leave it at 85.15, or whether you would use a 3x and go to you know, 90.10 as a but sorry, It just portfolio. seems to me that <coughs> You assume that somebody who absent this strategy would have something like a 45% stock. Right. And then you impose your floor requirement, and they still have that risk aversion, so you get, they, they generate an implicit 45% stock, at least at the outset. Right. And I would just assume that if their risk tolerance was such that they would otherwise have a 20% stock, but they had a floor requirement, then you'd probably get a 2x. 
I wouldn't yeah. use that. Am no, I missing something? not necessarily because okay, I'm missing something. Okay, so <laughs> the 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 difference would be if I had a lower risk tolerance, I could do that by lowering the leverage factor and taking my say it's say it's thirty percent. So instead of forty five, it's thirty. I could do that by changing my leverage from three to two. The other way I could do it is I can raise my floor from 85 to 90 percent and keep my leverage at three. And I'm just saying that sitting here, I don't know which of those is better. My guess is the latter is better. I guess my intuition is failing because of this strange juxtaposition of a regular utility function and a sort That's of right. slightly so arbitrary floor assumption. Yeah. Well, it's, it's picked by the person. They, no, they can change it. Yeah. But yeah, and it, it has these. Uh, it dramatically changes your your uh, response to uh, evolving wealth levels, and you really, I mean, I would want to uh, evaluate it before saying one way or the other. Okay, I think we're going to call it. Thank you. Thank you.